Hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar. We've got um, numbers increasing with people uh, joining, but we don't want to hold you up, so we will get started. It'll take us a minute or two to, to deal with introductions. Um, my name is Sarah Tedstone. I'm a partner in Field Fisher's data and privacy team. I deal 100% with data and privacy, and I'm a member of our specialist privacy health sector team. I'm joined today by Kate, who is a director in our team and also a member of the health sector team, and Anna, who's a senior associate, likewise, in uh, data and privacy and the health sector team. So uh, a couple of housekeeping issues. Um, we're planning to take about 45 minutes or so of your time. So we're hoping to give you time back at the top of the hour. Um, we are going to deal with an awful lot today, but you will all get um, a copy of the slides and the recording. We still do aim to deal with questions if we can, so please do put your questions um, in the chat function. We may deal with them as we go along or some at the end. Rest assured, if we don't get to your question during the webinar, we will follow up and make sure that you get an answer to deal with the issues. Um, so, uh, to, uh, we will start, we will carry on. So, um, on the next slide, it shows uh, the overview that we're going to deal with today. We're going to talk about privacy compliance in this space, so apps that deal with health data, but there's a conf complicated overlay with other regulations. So, I'll start to, to, to deal with first with some regulator warnings in this space. And then Kate is going to deal with the wider regulation landscape and the interplay with your data protection obligations. And Anna will then deal with um, what good privacy compliance looks like and will mop up with a list, list of actions with everything we've talked about. So on the next slide, we'll look at the growth in this space as, as a bit of a background, sort of an indication of why regulators have started to get more interested. So as the slide uh, indicates, <clears throat> uh, there's a, a statistic in the UK last year that 30% of adults look at a health app multiple times a day, with a third, further 25% looking at a health app once a day. So quite, quite a surprising statistic even at this point, but the growth that's projected indicates that this is likely to be phenomenal in the future. So global health apps generally, the market is projected to grow from 65 billion last year to 685 billion by 2030, with digital mental health apps growing to 14 billion by that time, and femtech in particular by 15 billion to that time. And on the next slide, a couple of slides, I'm going to talk about the drivers for that. So why has there been such growth? Why are we expected to have so much growth? Well, I, we think some of the driving factors for this are an increasing prevalence of chronic diseases that lend themselves so easily. They need continuous monitoring and regular checkups, and, and that lends itself to, to apps that can do that. <clears throat> also innovation, um, remote monitoring in particular has shown already that improvements in clinical participation and outcomes with decentralized clinical trials, uh, for example, showing these outcomes from remote monitoring. Um, increased awareness, particularly in women's healthcare. So um, algorithm insights um, derived from you know, this new collection of data, the research and review of it is showing really exciting innovation in that area. And on the next slide, um, we talk about um, the use of modern technology. So the advancement in technology means that there's better access globally. Um, personalized health solutions are becoming more likely and better health outcomes are predicted. So it's not surprising that there has been and is expected to be continued growth. So now I'm going to deal with um, regulation, some of the regulator warnings here. Undoubtedly, there's going to be a huge benefit for society as a whole and us as individuals. And with the increased prevalence, regulators you know, aware of that are, however, becoming 
concerned about some of the privacy aspects to this. And um, we've indicated here some of the regulator um, uh, 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 warnings and attention that's been received. So in the UK, the MHRA and NICE, um, working with Welcome, has looked at mental health tools in particular, and the Guardian also reported in this area. Um, linked to this, uh, the Mozilla, Mozilla Foundation looked at some mental um, health apps and found two thirds of them had privacy concerns. Um, the Guardian reported about some uh, reviews that indicated that uh, in this space, those using an app had potentially poorer outcomes than those usually looking at traditional therapies. So perhaps unsurprising then that regulators are saying they're going to look at whether there needs to be more regulation and in particular international cooperation for regulation in this space. We then also have the ICO, sorry if we can go back to the previous slide, we also have the ICO and the CMA um, looking recently and producing a joint statement saying they're concerned that harmful online design results in um, um, practices in privacy that are to be, uh, uh, that, that are not, not good. We have uh, in particular too much personal data being handed over where the privacy controls aren't good enough, the privacy information is not good, at a, good enough. They came out with some concerning stats that um, over 90% of users were concerned about their information being used without permission and over 50% being concerned about marketing. Um, we then have the ICO very recently looking at period and fertility tracking apps. Um, as they, uh, with polls also suggesting that more than half of the women were concerned about intrusive advertising following giving over health information to an app. And although the ICO didn't find any particular harmful outcomes, they were concerned enough about the privacy practices to produce a general warning urging all app developers to prioritise privacy. And they indicated a couple of areas that you should focus on and Anna's going to talk about those later. In addition, it's worth mentioning the ICO regularly produces Tech Horizons report, reporting on emerging tech and the issues they're focused on over the next few years. Health has featured in each one, concerns and issues that are involved, and we're going to touch on aspects of this later. So on the next slide, I'm just going to highlight some recent enforcement action examples in this area. So amazing really that there have been 150 fines involving over 25 countries for violations, um, privacy violations by the healthcare sector so far, but more, there have been more in the last 12 months than all other periods combined. So I think you can say that regulation, the focus of regulation, it's come to the attention of regulators and there will be more and more enforcement action if they're finding concerns with privacy compliance, particularly when they've given warnings about this. A couple of examples, there's the Vistamo case in Europe where a psychotherapy center had um, a breach uh, in fact, blackmail as a result of health data that had been obtained, and they were fined for their data protection violations, but also criminal personal sanctions on some of the management team because of the way they'd handled the situation. We've had the 23andMe uh, breach involving he health, significant health data with consequences ongoing, and a fine to Dudalus Biology um, following a health data breach. So, um, enforcement action probably ramping up as with the, vol the volume of these apps and health data use that's being used. So I'm now going to pass over to Kate and she's going to deal with the regulation landscape at the moment and what's to come. Thanks, Sarah. I think that was really interesting there just to hear about the enforcement action we're seeing in this space. And as Sarah said, I'm moving on now to talk a little bit more about the regulation landscape. Um, EU data regulation is no longer just privacy anymore. And I think many of us lawyers have gone from being privacy experts under the GDPR and the e-privacy directive to a real focus on data. And in many ways, if we look across this regulation landscape, um, much of it takes a risk-based approach. 
and there is a focus on high risk data such as health data. So we've got a real combination here of two key areas that we're talking about today. And I think this is a really interesting graphic here that helps just to visualize the vast amount of regulation that some of has already come into play or is coming into play very shortly in such a short amount of time. On the left hand side of the graphic here, um, we've got the regulations in this space that many of us will be familiar with and have worked um, with for a number of years now. We've got the uh, medical devices and we're going to briefly touch upon this and look at a high level example of when an app might be classified as a medical device as opposed to a mere lifestyle app and some potential privacy implications of this. We've got our data protection sphere here um, and I think doing this well is going to be vital in this space to ensure things like customer trust, the efficacy of the data that's going to be used in the apps, the saleability of the app, should this be of interest, and particularly that what Sarah is touching upon, we've got an increased level of interest from the regulators. So it's going to be really important to be able to readily demonstrate accountability and the privacy compliance to re regulators should it be required. We've also got, not to be forgotten there, the e-privacy directive, and this applies to e-marketing and cookies. And this is an area of concern to regulators, particularly when we're processing sensitive data, and that has, if that is used to then on market to end individuals. We've got data sharing and we've got the Data Act that now puts obligations on designers and manufacturers of connected products to allow users to easily and securely access and reuse the data generated by such products. And Sarah is going to look at this in more detail. Then we've got the EU AI Act, the final text, is, text of which has just been recently leaked. Um, and it also now appears the plenary vote on the AI Act is likely to take this place this month. So it's going to be coming into force sooner than we met, we initially expected. And I think here the point is, if AI is going to be used in your app, particularly if it's again, this concept of high risk, there's going to be further compliance measures that are going to be needed. And Anna's going to touch upon this. Cybersecurity, um, we have the NIS2 directive, um, on the EU side of things. And this may now actually apply to health apps, even if it didn't apply to you under the previous directive. And I'm gonna to touch upon this topic later in our presentation. I think what I would say, we're actively monitoring the legislation across across the team here. So if today's presentation raises any compliance questions for you specifically, do get in touch with us and we'd be more than happy to assist. So just moving on to the next slide, um, on, the, on this slide, we just wanted to give a very high level example here of how an app might be regulated in the privacy space outside of just the GDPR and the e-privacy directive. That said though, it's a really complex area, um, particularly um, the medical device regulations. And these are gonna differ in each jurisdiction and even the UK position is under review. So just something to take into consideration. But here I've added an ex um, the definition of what a medical device is as it is currently in the UK. And this is something a lot of our clients are interested in understanding because there are different obligations if you fall into the medical device category rather than a mere lifestyle app. And I think we see a lot of entrants in the health app space. They're wanting to ensure that their app falls more into the lifestyle category, at least initially. So onto the next slide and looking at when an app might be considered a medical device. So softwares um, included in the definition of a medical device and a smartphone app is likely to be considered a medical device if it has a medical intended purpose. For example, um, if it's intended to influence actual treatment if it results in a diagnosis or prognosis, or if it is linked to specific medicine or device. Apps can also be treated as a medical device component if they're the only way of interacting with a physical device. But if we look at the um, lifestyle purposes, some healthcare apps might not be seen as a medical device if they're more generally in these categories, something that will generally monitor fitness, health or well-being. 
Similarly, if the app just reproduces a paper document into a digital format or just provides information without decision making, it might be unlikely to be a medical device. Now, Sarah's just going to touch upon what some of the privacy implications are if your app is categorized as a medical device rather than say this more general category of lifestyle purposes. Thanks, Kate. So as Kate mentioned, we've touched on the medical device regulations because um, obviously the, re the regulatory impact will be significant for you if your app's caught within that, but there are also privacy implications for that. So um, the medical device regs in particular um, are categorized according to risk group. There'll be different obligations depending on the risk group. Um, software that, uh, uh, that is involved with it will also be caught and you know it's a vast lands landscape but that doesn't mean you forget the privacy laws and the privacy compliance in fact quite the opposite it's been made clear that your privacy compliance overlays all other regulation and there will be significant implications so with the medical device regulations there will be increased personal data processing effectively significant increase there's requirements for uh, personal data processing in investigations in assessments to improve the quality and and for even reporting to regulators. There's also going to be significant retention of personal data, needing to keep information for a significant amount of time, and also the sharing of data um, increased in that. Um, so there's going to, you're going to have to still consider your data protection obligations when um, performing your other obligations under other laws and for other regulators. This will mean a balancing act. For example, you've got an obligation for minimization and not keeping information for too long. Long. So you, you still need to consider these privacy obligations when you're looking at your other obligations. So next, I'm going to deal with um, the fact that we're talking about health data here. So um, first of all, you need to consider whether it is health data that you're involved with within your app model. Um, for example, the ICO touched on this in its first Tech Horizons report, where it was talking about a situation where you may have a doctor, you go for an examination, you have some health tests, and the conclusion might be that you need to get some more exercise, as opposed to an app that is logging your steps and might recommend you know, a larger total of steps or a, a number of steps per day, and whether the latter truly is health data or not. You've got definitions of health data within GDPR and other data protection laws. So one of your steps will be to assess whether you will be deemed to be having um, health data and then what that means to you. If it is health data under data protection laws, it's deemed to be high risk. There are significant other obligations throughout the data protection laws that you'll need to be aware of. But the fact that it might be health data might have other significant uh, implications too. For example, it might mean that you're accessing public health data. So in the UK, that might be NHS data with significant other implications, principles and standards to follow. There's an NHS toolkit. There's national opt-out that might be relevant for research and planning and codes and frameworks. And they're also all aimed at protecting personal data too. You've got other legislation that might apply. We've already dealt with the medical devices. There'll be jurisdictional aspects that will be relevant, such as HIPAA in the US, different requirements for clinical trials, depending on your location involved. There also will be common law aspects to consider, such as medical consent, which is different from data protection consent, and law, common law uh, preserving confidentiality. We've touched on the fact there'll be multiple regulators with requirements that involved increased high-risk processing. So this assessment needs to be made too. And next, I'm going to deal with e-marketing. So we, we're not going to go into this in detail. We have webinars that touch on e-marketing, you know, to deal with it solely uh, without other aspects. We won't have time to, to delve into this, but just to mention, um, this is obviously an area to, of concern to regulators. They've produced stats about, um, you know, issues to users who are concerned about their data being used and shared 
and then the potential of them being suggested um, web marketing elsewhere off app even it's a trust issue potentially and trust will be important to you if you're wanting users to share health data with you for the app to work so emphasizing that there are specific rules that will apply uh, Kate mentioned uh, e-privacy directive and regulation in Europe PECA in the UK and other local laws that you'll need to comply with obviously we're not going to touch on all those laws but practically um, you know, common denominators are you'll need to be able to allow real control to users if you are going to be thinking about marketing um, to those users. You'll need to be clear and specific about the means of marketing, so texts or otherwise, by who, potentially for what campaigns. You'll need to be refreshing that model regularly and you'll need to be using suppression lists probably and also emphasizing that collecting marketing consents for others is notoriously difficult. So now we've talked about um, some of the regulatory issues we're going to talk to that are currently in place. We're gonna to talk to you now about a few that are coming down the road as if you didn't have enough to think about at the moment, here's what's going to come. Thank you, Sarah. So this, this area will actually be only relevant to you where, if you are implementing AI in your health apps. Um, and with the plenary vote on the AI Act now scheduled to take place on the 13th of March, if the Act is adopted then it may enter into force possibly even in April, um, starting the clock on the application of the Act, which has been staggered at intervals across the next three years. And the AI Act aims to ensure the protection of fundamental rights, which is of course very significant in the context of health, where AI deployment may expose individuals to risks of bias and even risks of uh, physical harm. And the Act introduces different rules based on the level of risk from AI. They move from unacceptable risks, high risk to low risk. AI used in healthcare might be classed as a medical device um, under the EU medical devices regulations that Kate mentioned. Um, and medical devices, of course, may include health apps. And in, the, in, in such case, health apps that are classed as medical devices, they will be treated as high risk, um, high risk systems. And health apps may also include AI for direct interaction with people, for example, chatbots, which irrespective of whether they qualify as high risk, uh, will be subject to specific transparency obligations, i.e. notifying individuals that they are interacting with an AI system, unless it's obvious um, in the context of use. So as an example, if a health app is, um, that is classed as a medical device, if you have a health app that will be classed as a medical device, it will be subject to new rules, including a requirement to train, validate and test data sets in line with data governance requirements. There will also be required requirements for certain assessments, a conformity assessment and fundamental rights assessment, and also further requirements on risk management, testing, transparency, human oversight and cybersecurity. So if you're considering whether these new requir requirements may be relevant to you or how they will be relevant to you, do come and speak to us um, if you would like uh, some support. And I'm afraid today we only have time to flag these high level points, but if you're interested and if it's relevant, AI has been discussed in our last webinar in this Privacy for Health and Life Science series as well as in several AI-focused webinars, which are available on our YouTube channel. And also there are some upcoming ones, including one in March on high-risk AI, which may be very relevant to some um, health apps. Thanks, Anna. I'm now going to look at the Data Act in Europe. Um, one that may not be on people's radar as much as AI. I think everyone's talking about AI. We're getting lots of questions. But the, if the Data Act applies to you, then there could be significant consequences for you um, having a, a health act. So it applies. It's European legislation. So very broadly, very quickly, it will be relevant to um, services and users in Europe. Um, so you'll need to do an assessment to begin with to decide whether this will apply to you. Um, you've got until September next year to be compliant if this does apply to you. 
broadly we're talking about connected products and it expressly see, includes uh, medical and health devices and may well apply to apps but for your particular model for your particular app um, we recommend that you come and talk to us and we can consider whether the act will apply to you. It's talking about non-personal data, but the sharing and exchange of it for the benefit of the user in particular. So it's talking about making data accessible, um, avoiding unfair contract terms, increasing transparency. It also looks at the international use of data and government access. So particular um, examples are where a device um, uh, originally might have been restricted and the data locked down to the original provider or manufacturer and this is talking about opening up so for example you might want to get a device repaired and you're able then to go elsewhere to get a cheaper repair with any data needed to be shared for example so not a typical example in relation to an app so we'd need to consider the applicability to it but if it does apply to you and your app the um, relevance of you being forced almost to, to share data that's been collected in the app by user input, but also when the user is inactive. So any data that it's collecting uh, indirectly, you know, could have important implications for you. So uh, come and talk to us if, if uh, you have concerns about that. Passing over to Kate, who's going to talk to you about NIST 2. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Another exciting piece of legislation here, just in case um, you weren't keeping up, we've got NIS2 and there's only so much I can cover in, in two slides, um, but we did do a fuller webinar on this in our last Health and Life Science um, a webinar for businesses. But here, just a very quick overview, and again, this is an EU piece of legislation, much like the Data Act that Sarah's just touched upon. Um, the, this NIS2 or the Network and Information Security Directive entered into force on the 16th of January last year, 2023, replacing the 2016 NIS Directive. Um, and it's really, it's about establishing cyber risk management measures and reporting requirements for an expanded list of high critical sectors, which is more likely to pick up businesses in the health and the life science sectors now. So even though it came into force uh, last year, member states have until October of this year to transpose the directive into national legislation. So what we're saying is for organisations, they need to get ready now to ensure they're compliant when the directive comes into force in October of this year. And that is something we're helping a number of businesses with. So just on this slide here, I've, we've got the, um, the examples really of how the scope has widened to essential entities and important entities based on the sector's criticality. And you can see on this side, slide, sorry, some of the examples of this widened scope. So for example, important entities now include wearable devices, telehealth solutions, software as a medical device. Um, all of these examples will directly impact on the health app space and really show the need um, for those organisations that are all, that are in this space and have these kind of apps to do an assessment to see how the NIS2 might apply to you. And just on the next slide here, in terms of some of those key developments that might apply to you, um, it's really important that both the essential and the important entities adopt certain cyber security risk management measures, including risk analysis measures, um, information security policies, incident handling protocols and business continuity plans. And one element that has really captured the attention of many of our clients is the fact that there's going to be direct liability for management teams. And so this is again is a space that we're really helping our clients get to grips with and understand and really to do that initial assessment to see if this is an area they need to comply with. Next, Anna is now going to look at what good privacy compliance looks like in the health app space. Thanks, Kate. Um, and I think it's fair to start as part of our webinar by reiterating the points that Sarah's made and Kate, I think that good privacy and compliance, good privacy compliance in health apps is vital because really the function of these apps is based on processing very sensitive personal data. 
And that importance of privacy is clear both from the perspective of the app users and also the regulators. As Sarah mentioned, you know, just last month, the ICL concluded its review of period and fertility apps. And based on that, all urged all app developers to prioritize privacy. And the ICL has shared uh, four practical tips on how to comply with data protection obligations. And these ICL tips, of course, cover a lot of compliance ground. But we have also looked at further regulatory guidance, including those regulatory warnings that Sarah's mentioned earlier on, um, governmental review of app security and privacy, and also a wealth of other regulatory guidance, including from the EDPB. And based on that, and also based on our experience, we've added some further areas that are important for good privacy compliance in health apps. Um, and here they are on the slide, um, data mapping, transparency, legal basis, data protection by design and default, data sharing, security, DPIA and accountability. And important to, to remember that, of course, they will relate to privacy compliance in your business as usual processing, but also in any disclosures that you might be required to make to regulators if you are caught by those other regulatory regimes that Kate has outlined earlier. So now uh, we'll be looking at each of these areas and uh, the first necessary step towards good compliance is mapping out the data flows and assessing data protection rules of all parties that are involved in processing. And as you can see, there are quite a few key players just in the mobile app ecosystem. So we will look at their roles in ensuring good privacy. Of course, on top of that, uh, there is also a supply chain in health business model, which will also need to be assessed. But today um, we have time to focus on the app ecosystem mainly. So firstly, we have app ecosystem, uh, app developers and providers. And to the extent that they process personal data, they may decide how the app and any backend systems that uh, it links to will process that data. So in other words, they may decide on the purposes and means of processing, in which case there would be a controller and of course would be accountable for GDPR compliance. In the context of health apps, there may be projects between multiple parties, for example, app developers, app providers for medical professionals and clinical sites like hospitals, which can give rise to multiple controllers and possibly even joint controllership where project partners agree on the common purpose for the processing and on the essential means. So for example, you could have a project uh, to collect and analyze certain data via a health app to inform clinical decisions. Secondly, we have app stores. So typically apps are downloaded via app stores. And it would be necessary, of course, to assess you know, what is actually happening in terms of processing and the extent to which personal data is involved. But app stores could be considered controllers, for example, in respect of the registration and payment details. If an app store processes payments for apps or supports in-app purchases or combines such data with any other device generated data. And app stores can also support privacy compliance through providing meaningful information about transparency in the privacy permissions requested by an app, um, along with any justifications for why each of these permissions is needed, um, and also by vetting apps and blocking any malicious and insecure apps from the store. Thirdly, we have the operating systems and device manufacturers um, they should also be viewed as controllers of data process for their own purposes, for example, device security, which may include personal data processed as a result of the installation of an app or use of the app. And in addition to those key players, app developers and app providers can, of course, engage third parties to conduct certain operations, for example, to provide analytics on their behalf and under their instructions in which case a third party would act as a processor. However, where a third party processes app data for their own purpose, for example, collects information across multiple apps to supply additional services to app providers, such as um, analytics at a larger scale, for example, they will likely be acting as a controller, 
<clears throat> and this illustrates that there can be many different parties involved in the processing of personal data in the app ecosystem. And possibly there could also be further parties in a health business supply chain. So there's certainly complexity around the parties involved. And that may, of course, pose challenges for health apps, particularly around security and around data sharing. So you will certainly need um, those contracts with appropriate data protection terms, whether processor terms, mandatory processor terms or controller terms. And you also need to understand who does what with what data that really will be fundamental to meeting your compliance obligations. So let's move on to transparency now. Transparency is a key data protection principle, fundamentally linked to fairness, and it means that you have to be transparent with the app users about what data the app is collecting and how uh, you will use that data. In practice, it means that controllers who have the obligations around transparency will need to provide a privacy notice which explains what data they will be processing for what purpose, who they will be sharing their data with, how long they will retain their data, etc. To ensure that your processing is transparent and fair, you will need to provide that information in a way that will allow users to um, make an informed decision about using your app. So you will need to cover the app specific information rather than say use a generic privacy notice like your website notice. And if your app is accessible to children, such information will need to be provided in an age appropriate manner so that it's easily understandable by children as well. And with, as with any privacy notice, it must be concise, clear, easy to understand, which of course in, for health apps, it may be challenging given that uh, they process a lot of data and given that the processing as we've just uh, covered may involve quite a few parties. But following the regulatory focus on privacy notices, and that includes a very high profile enforcement like the WhatsApp decision, um, as well as scrutiny from civic society, like Sarah mentioned, the Mozilla Foundation, privacy not included reports on mental health and reproductive health apps, and also just need to build trust with the app users, it certainly is a challenge that needs to be taken seriously. And how do you provide a privacy notice in a health app? It needs to be done as part of a sign-up path in advance of a sign-up, and it must be easily accessible in the app. Of course, you also need to make sure that you update your privacy notice if you release any new functionalities or new versions, if they affect the scope of your processing. And you may also want to provide additional transparency information by way of just-in-time notices, such as um, in-app pop-ups. So let's move on now and let's focus on appropriate legal basis. We know that all personal data processing requires an appropriate legal basis and for the processing of special category data such as health data, you will also need an additional condition. There are a number of potentially appropriate legal bases to consider for different purposes of processing within the app. So you have, can have contractual necessity, legitimate interest, consent, legal obligation, and you will need to very carefully assess you know, which legal basis is most appropriate um, in your circumstances. There is a lot of guidance on that on lawful basis. And as we have different types of businesses on this webinar, uh, we cannot give specific advice. It's, it's too complex. But please do come and speak to us uh, if you would like some support on this. And just to note, uh, consent in this context, when speaking about consent, um, it's not the same as medical consent. And consent can be very problematic in health apps due to the need for it to be informed, specific, uh, freely given and unambiguous. And you also need an additional condition for the processing of health data. Um, one of them is, of course, explicit consent, but of course, relying on consent can raise practical difficulties, such as you know, whether sufficiently accurate information about the processing can be given for that consent to be considered informed, and the potential withdrawal of consent. So always consider whether any other more suitable conditions may be available to you. And that may be the case, for example, if a health app is a medical device and the app provider needs the app data to comply with their legal obligations under the medical devices regulations or, for example, in the context of research. Though, of course, this will be always subject to very strict conditions and will need to be 
carefully assessed um, on a case by case basis. So now moving on to data protection by design and default. Uh, to implement this principle, data protection requirements must be considered at the development stage and not just as an afterthought. And privacy protective choices and settings must be embedded into the design and they must be made uh, applicable by default. What does it mean in practice? Well, you will certainly need to contact your privacy team or your DPO or legal team um, at the very outset of any new app proposal uh, to allow them sufficient time to identify and also contribute to mitigating any risks identified from a data protection point of view. And a couple of practical examples of how data protection by design and by default could be implemented into health apps. They include ensuring that the app processes only data necessary to achieve its specific purposes. So you will need to limit the collection of data and ensure that you're deleting or anonymizing data that is no longer needed. Using pseudonymized data whenever possible implementing appropriate security measures and Kate will give some examples of those. Um, also uh, providing easy to use data protection control tools and allowing app users to easily change privacy settings following the installation. And another important aspect of data protection by design will be avoiding deceptive design patterns, also known as dark patterns, uh, such as nudging users to provide consent to additional processing or to change their privacy settings to a less privacy protective options, or designing users' journey um, in a way that hinders users' ability to control their data. So, for example, by bundling consent. Lack of control over tracking is another common example of, of harmful design to be avoided uh, and one each, when each health apps may actually lead to intrusive targeted advertising. Apps should also incorporate user-friendly interfaces which can facilitate the exercise of data subject rights, for example, by providing secure online access tools. And I think that's um, enough uh, about data protection by design and by default. So let's move on to data sharing and um, Kate, it's over to you for that one. Thanks, Anna. Um, I think on the compliant data sharing, no health app is likely to operate in a silo. And I think Anna's slide on the mobile ecosystem really helped demonstrate that. And I think actually Anna's touched on a number of these points already. You know, if you've got controller to controller data sharing, you need to ensure you've got a legal basis for sharing. You should also be considering things perhaps like the ICO's data sharing code of practice. If you're engaging a service provider, you need to make sure you've done all those normal due diligence checks that you would do and put the right Article 28 contracts in place. Um, I think it's really important in this space to really understand and do that data mapping. This will help you understand um, where your onward data transfers are. So if you need, for example, to implement standard contractual clauses, or if you also need to under, uh, undertake a transfer impact assessment. Um, this element about transparency I think is really key. It's about building trust but also understanding your data flows and understanding where your data is will help you to explain this in your privacy notice and also as part of your app store permissions. Um, you know, you're dealing with very sensitive data here, so that really increases the risk and the level of scrutiny you're likely to receive on your privacy notice and in terms of your data sharing. And as we've already really touched upon, and Sarah's talked about, you know, compliance with the e-marketing rules, um, particularly with uh, intrusive marketing and personalised advertising that a lot of end users see in this space. And then just moving on to the next slide, security. Again, talking about this high risk nature of health data, ensuring that the security measures really match that and they're appropriate to meet this high risk processing of health data. Um, I think in this space, again, it's really important that our legal teams can work effectively with the technical teams to ensure the right security measures are in place. 
Um, and this is an area we've seen some really large regulatory fines when companies get this wrong. And I think with the focus of NIS2 introducing personal liability for management teams, it's still a really key area for organisations to get right. Um, I think there's a number of concepts in, in the health space that we're very familiar with that can also be applied in the app space and the health app space. You know, those concepts of anonymization and more particularly synonymization and applying those to, um, to your apps where you can. That also touches on Anna's um, slide that she's talked about. And I've got here really a number of suggestions that can be implemented to mitigate risks. And these are really going to be important to document as part of your DPIA. And that's something that Sarah is going to talk about with you now. Absolutely. This is the last slide uh, for the webinar, apart from a couple of slides where I'll just summarise what we've been saying with a bit of an action list. Um, and although this is the last slide, your, your data protection impact assessment actually should come very early on in your process for uh, designing and building an app. Um, I'm just going to touch on one question that we've received, which is about um, how you deal with your privacy compliance obligations where you, you're dealing with another regulator or another law where it's almost mandatory. And um, I, come and, by all means, come and talk to us. But the position here is sort of not forgetting the privacy principles. So it's dealing with a minimum amount of personal data, um, considering you know, what information you need to be giving to individuals about having to share that information under, under laws with others. Your lawful basis might be legal obligation or considering, you know, justifying how you're doing it and also how rights might apply to that. So if data subjects are exercising their rights, you know, how that applies if they ask you to forget them or to erase data, you know, the, the, the context of doing that when you're doing it under a legal obligation. It's sort of these, these um, interplay between the obligations that mustn't be forgotten. But the data protection impact assessment um, is a key privacy compliance document. Um, it draws everything together. It means that you understand um, everything that applies to the app, but it's significantly involved in reducing risk. In fact, there is a mandatory requirement for you to consult with a regulator, ultimately, if, you, if your DPIA concludes that you haven't reduced risks. It involves you consulting with your DPO, which might be mandatory in this area. Um, it might be mandatory to undertake a data protection impact assessment if you're involved with health data um, and it involves consideration overall. Probably don't need to talk about it any more than that, other than it's a document that might get produced to regulators, so it's significant. So next, we're just going to deal with a roundup of everything we've talked about. And you can see there's an awful lot really that's involved. So we've got a fairly significant to-do list as you might expect, but we're just going to summarise what we've said really. So your actions will involve an assessment of whether and if so where you're using health data actually in the app model and mopping, mapping then the data flows. This gives you an awareness of the privacy obligations in design of the model beginning to end. Um, as we've indicated, that does mean knowing all the parties that are involved. We looked at the parties you might not always think about in the uh, creation of the app and the function of it, but also there will be other parties involved in the production of the service, in the processing of health data, and all these parties need to be considered and the data protection roles that apply to them because that will start to indicate the obligations that might apply across the model. We've said you need to probably mandatory to produce a DPIA to reduce all the risks. And it's probably right that you'll need to do that at the outset and to do it ongoing, you'll have to update it and reconsider it, particularly if things change. You're probably going to have to involve your DPO. You might have a mandatory DPO requirement in this space with health data. You'll have to certainly have to involve somebody who um, uh, has responsibility for privacy uh, in relation to this to um, reduce risk and to be aware of the privacy requirements, particularly in design and default effectively. 
It's likely that you're going to have mandatory contract terms with all the parties involved and data protection terms within those contracts. It might also involve your safeguards for international transfers. And that's the next point is understanding those international transfers and possibly transfer impact assessments or other kinds of assessments depending on location that might be needed. Kate took you through the security measures that might be appropriate, remembering that this is high risk processing we're talking about. And then on the next slide, we finish off the action list. We look at an assessment of the lawful basis for processing and sharing that Anna talked about. If we are going to get involved in e-marketing, then we've already seen regulator concern about that. So your e-marketing compliance is going to be crucial and linked to that, your consent model will need to be considered. So do you need consent? How are you going to get it? How are you going to have it to the standard that's needed? Um, how are you going to refresh it? And how are you going to uh, recognize people's preferences? You'll need an agreement as to who's going to be responsible for data subject rights, complaints, breaches, and all the processes to have effective responses by the right people to, to all of these aspects. As we indicated, there are other health laws, local privacy laws, other regulators involved. You'll need to understand that from the outset and you'll have to create effective data protection compliant methods of complying with those laws and reporting to other regulators. And unfortunately, that's not enough. You need to be looking at the horizon, monitoring new legislation that ex that's expected, what those deadlines are and how it will apply to you. So on the next slide, never fear um, you can always contact us um, we have a couple of questions we may follow up on with people we promised we would but we didn't want to keep you uh, too long and give you time back at the end of the webinar and that's what we'll do but by all means contact us if you want to discuss any of the issues that have been raised today or if you'd like some help with any of this we'd be very glad to help you but other, otherwise we've we've finished and we're very glad that you spent this time with us and we hope it's been useful